Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, God blesses. There's a supernatural blessing attached to Bible prophecy. Listen to it. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. So today, as you have taken the time to listen to teaching on Bible prophecy, you have literally touched upon a supernatural blessing. God guaranteed the book of Revelation, Bible prophecy, the only book of all 66 books that is incentivized with a supernatural blessing to those who would dedicate themselves to it. All who read it, all who listen to it, all who obey it. Prophecy content is what separates the Bible from all other religions and all other religious and what some might call their sacred writings. Now, I don't expect you to invest the amount of time and effort and research that I have committed throughout my lifetime to study eschatology and Bible prophecy and end time events and, and so on. That's my calling. That's my responsibility before God. However, I do want all of those who follow our ministry, every Christian should be a lifelong student of the Bible, and it is important to understand the fundamentals of Bible prophecy and the chronology of end time events. So with that laid down as a foundation upon which we can build, let's build our message. Again, the teaching today, Bible prophecy and the chronology of end time events. In our study today, uh, I want to address uh, something that's vitally important. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'll come back to it. But I strongly believe in what is called in the world of theology, the pre-millennial view of interpreting Bible prophecy. Now, I'm not going to wade into that controversial pool today. I will tell you that there and I confessed as we begin that there are differing views. But I am going to devote an entire study uh, coming soon on the four main views on interpreting Bible prophecy. If you're taking notes, uh, the first is called the preterist view. P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T. -E -E the preterist view. And preterists believe that everything has already been fulfilled in the past. The second main way that people interpret Bible prophecy is called the historist view. And these are people who believe that it's currently being interpreted in our world now. Uh, the third view is oftentimes called the idealist's view. And they believe that prophecy and the interpretation is, is timeless. Uh, not a lot of scholarship in that, in, in my humble opinion. And then what we call the futurist view or the premillennial view, which believes and interprets scripture that these events are yet to come. They have not already been fulfilled, as some would try to tell you. That's why you sometimes hear, uh, especially when it comes to the teaching and the interpretation of the tribulation. Will the church go through the tribulation? Will we go through the first half of the tribulation? Will we go through all the trip? That's why people have so many differing views on the tribulation is they've received misguided teaching on one of these other views. Uh, I apologize for touching upon that and arousing your curiosity, but I just want you to know that I am teaching this chronology based upon the pre-millennial view, the futuristic view, and I will teach on that in the very near future. When we talk about the chronology of Bible prophecy, uh, many Bible scholars divide the chronology of Bible prophecy into two parts. And if you're taking notes, this is where the meat of the study begins. And the two parts that most who teach on the chronology of Bible prophecy 
divide this into are events in heaven, number one, events in heaven, and number two, events on the earth. I actually feel that's a great way to teach the chronology of Bible prophecy, and I'm going to provide it in this resource for you today. And so today I'm going to focus upon the events in heaven. And whether we'll get into the events here on earth, uh, because that has uh, more content, uh, there's a good chance that I might draw a line in the sand at some point in this Bible study and take a break and we'll divide this teaching into part one and part two. So if you're taking notes, write down in your notes the events in heaven. And so the chronology of end time events and number one, the events in heaven. For all of humanity, there is soon to come a sequence of prophetic events that will have attached with them eternal consequences. So let's begin with the next major prophetic event in the chronology of end time events. And those of you that have been students of mine for some time, you know exactly what that is. It is the rapture of the church. And so the study, the chronology of end time events, divided into two parts, the events in heaven and the second part, the events on earth. We're dealing now with the events in heaven and we begin with the rapture. Now, you could, if you wanted to be technical, you could actually list the rapture under events on heaven. But the reason why I don't include it in the events, or excuse me, the events on earth is because you leave the earth in the twinkling of an eye. You meet the Lord in the air. We're going to teach on this a little bit. But I have chosen to include the rapture of the church under the events of heaven. So in your timeline, the next major prophetic event, the rapture of the church. Now there are three classical passages in the New Testament that support the rapture of the church. Sooner or later, you're going to hear somebody say, the word rapture is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Well, the word Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Uh, the word Bible is nowhere to be found in the Bible. It is really kind of a low uh, level assault to attack the theology of the rapture with that leading statement, the word rapture is nowhere to be found in the Bible. There are theological terms that are used in teaching the Bible, and those theological terms may or may not be found in the Bible, but they are in the Bible. The rapture is the catching up. Uh, the Bible speaks of being caught up. If you want to call it the catching up or being caught up and the word rapture offends you, uh, I'm not going to lose any sleep over your decision. But let me give you the three classical passages that define the rapture. Number one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And go down to uh, verses 15 through 18. This is the first of the classical passages on the rapture. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said in verse 15, We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. Caught up. Highlight that. That's where the term rapture comes from. Uh, a man by the name of Jerome, a famous theologian, uh, back in 400 AD, translated the original man's manuscripts into Latin, and uh, the word 
rapio uh, from the Greek is where we get the word rapture, and I have a tremendous amount of teaching on that. Go back and find our teaching on questions on the rapture. If you want a thorough, detailed, scholastic teaching on the rapture of the church, I have multiple teachings available. Begin with the video or the podcast, Questions on the Rapture. The Bible says, We who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and go down to verses 50 through 57. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 through 57. There the apostle Paul wrote, What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Pause right there. The body that you currently have has a lifespan. There is an expiration date. The Bible gives us the right to believe the Lord for 70 years, if by God's favor, 80 years. If you were obedient to your parents, the Bible said there is a blessing of long life to those who honor their father and mother. But this body is not going to live forever. Rarely do people make it to a hundred. Many do, but Rarely. The average age of expiration is much younger than that. And so because when these bodies were created, they were created for this earth, there needs to be a transformation in the rapture for the bodies of those that were resurrected in Christ and those who are alive and remain. There needs to be a transformation and we then possess a body that will be equipped for our new destination. If I can put it in that simple explanation, let's read on. Our physical bodies, our current earthly bodies, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. This body was not made with a forever guarantee. Let's read on. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. But we will be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me read the third classical passage. Uh, it's found in John's Gospel and the 14th chapter and verses 1 through 3. John's Gospel chapter 14 verses 1, 2, and 3. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you. That's the rapture. I will come and get you. That's the great catching away so that you will always be with me where I am. So I wanted to take the time because the rapture is such a, a tremendous subject that people are attracted to and have questions about, and some say it's not in the Bible. 
So I felt it important in this study of the chronology of end time events to at least give you as a foundation for understanding the rapture those three classical passages and mark them in your Bible and return to them as needed. By the way, the rapture will be the ending of the church age. Jesus prophesied in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church age began in Acts chapter 2 in the upper room and the church age will end at the rapture of the church. The Bible reveals to us that the rapture takes place in a systematic chronology and I want you to write that down. The chronology of the rapture, first, the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain on this earth at the time of the rapture shall be taken. Both the dead in Christ, followed by those Christians who are alive on this earth, will be taken and will meet the Lord. The scripture tells us we'll meet Him in the air. In that moment, in what the Bible calls the twinkling of an eye, something else systematically is going to happen. We are going to go through a supernatural transformation. in the air and remain in the air, we will be taken, we'll meet him in the air, and we're on route to a destination. And the destination is we're caught up and taken to heaven. We will be taken to heaven by the Lord to be with the Lord, just as he promised in his earthly ministry when he walked in the sandals in the Middle East here on this earth. Uh, we read about that in John 14, 2 and 3. There the Bible said, There is more than enough room in my Father's home. By the way, when you read in the Bible, Father's home, it's just an expression for heaven. He said, Jesus, there is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be where I am. So in the chronology of end time prophetic events, the next major prophetic event you should have in your notes, the rapture of the church. And then I took the time to just briefly fill in the blanks and show you that there's actually a chronology and a systematic uh, process of leaving this earth and arriving in heaven. All right. After the rapture, in your notes, write down the judgment seat of Christ. After the rapture, we are taken to heaven. Once we are in heaven, now if you'll remember, that's why I included the rapture in part one, events in heaven. We've divided this Bible study into two parts, events in heaven, events here on the earth. Now you know why I put this under the category of events in heaven, because the rapture is a twinkling of an eye taken from this earth. We journey with Christ. We're taken to heaven. Once we arrive in heaven, the chronology of events according to the Bible takes us from the rapture to the judgment seat of Christ. Now the judgment 
seat of Christ describes an event that takes place after the rapture and takes place in heaven. Uh, if you want to write down some passages of Scripture to read and to study on the judgment seat of Christ, uh, write down 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, and Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Let me give those to you again for those who are making notation. These are passages that describe in the Bible the judgment seat of Christ. We find reference to that in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15. Then again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11 and also a reference to it in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Now what is the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ? The Bible says we'll appear before Christ in heaven after the rapture as believers who have served the Lord and in that judgment all of the works that we did on this earth are going to face judgment. Now there is no chance of being judged and rejected from heaven and sent back to earth or to hell. Once you have been taken in the rapture, your eternal life with the Lord is secure and can never be revoked. But in the judgment seat of Christ, your life will be judged to determine your eternal rewards. Where do we find that? Let's go to 2 Corinthians, and let me take the time to read it to you. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, and go down to verse 10. There the Bible says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve, for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know that too. So the rapture of the church, again, today's Bible study, the chronology of end time events. We've divided it into...